faith. It's something we want. It's something we claim to have. But really, what does faith look like? How would we get more of it? How can we allow our faith to be stronger and stronger? Well, in my message, my message today, Jesus meets someone whose faith is absolutely striking to him. I want to look at that faith and see if you and I can de develop a little bit more of that for ourselves. Welcome to First Press to our message, and we look forward to seeing you here at 601 Pine, where you can come and join us. God bless. Well, I don't have any of you heard, you must have heard some of you from the praise team, how they're doing there in the wilds of Eugene. It's probably hard for them being over there. Uh, you know, you know those people, you know what they're like out there, but I'm sure they're having a great time. I was talking to Steve uh, before he left. He said, man, you know, you take high school kids on a trip. They just get on the bus and go. You take a team like this and it's like, uh, the medications have to be right. <laughs> Uh, someone has uh, three other people they're going to meet in Eugene and they can need a special arranger and on and on it goes. I, uh, yep, yep. I just hope nobody dies on the trip, Steve, and I'm sure they won't. It'll just be great. Well, I hope you are taking these teachings of Jesus to heart and applying them to your life as we've been going through this wonderful piece on the Sermon on the Plain. We now come to the end of that and we get back into Jesus' sort of peripatetic or traveling ministry. And in our passage today, Jesus travels back to Capernaum. And that is famous as the town where there was the man with the four friends where he was lowered through the roof. So they know about Jesus as someone who heals. Well now his reputation goes before him and he is greeted by folks who are concerned for another friend as he enters into town. So listen now to God's word from Luke chapter 7 beginning at verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master, highly, who his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some, soldiers, some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Let us pray. And now God, allow us as your servants to understand the message for each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Just prior to this passage, Jesus had given that challenging teaching where he told us, love your enemies. And now, just after that, they, these elders are coming asking him to help on behalf of a centurion. Now we know how, up, how uptight the Jews were about dealing with Gentiles. And this was not just any Gentile. A centurion is a person who is a commander of 80 men at the very least. But they could command up to six of these groups and so would have 480 men or just under 500 folks at their disposal and because they had that level of authority they had a level of pay that was commensurate with that and so they were often seen as not only the powerful but also wealthy persons in town 
And obviously, this centurion had wealth because he helped the local people build their synagogue. So while he was a Gentile, the elders of the town were grateful for his graciousness and the fact that he honored God. And so they wanted to be of some assistance when the centurion said to them, would you please go and speak to Jesus? And he had a heart-wrenching situation. His servant was dying. So right away we have two indicators that this was an unusual man. First of all, he cared about his community and gave graciously from his wealth. And he cared about what we might call his employee. Because servants at that time is not what we think, slaves I should say at that time, is not what we think of as slaves today. That is 30 to 40% of all the people in the Roman Empire were under the category of slaves. Slaves were often highly skilled and highly regarded, so it would not seem that unusual that there was this deep personal bond with his slave. And what's also interesting is that these elders, they are asking Jesus to go to his house. That was a big deal. The author of Luke also writes the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, Peter enters into the house of another centurion who is named Cornelius, who probably owned a home big enough to have a crowd there for Peter to bear witness. And the story goes like this. Peter is, is, down, is uh, in another place... And uh, he is in a town called Jaffa. And uh, Cornelius receives a vision of how faithful, the, because he's been so faithful, he wants him to go and ask Peter to come to his house. At the very same time, Peter is getting this vision of these unclean things coming down. And he's supposed to take it and eat it. And all that is some message that Peter says, I don't know what it means, but Lord, I would do nothing to go against you. And just as he is trying to interpret that vision, there is a knock at the door. It's the delegation from the centurion Cornelius' home and asks him to come. Well, Peter goes to the house. I'm sure he he hesitates by the door, but he goes in to that place. And as he goes in, the people bow down to Peter. He says, no, wait, no, wait, get up. I'm just a man. But then he tells them about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit just descends on this crowd. I mean, they're speaking in tongues. They're aware that God is present. It is exciting. In fact, it's so exciting that Peter says, can anyone deny these people being baptized? He takes them out. He baptizes them. It's a great day. They're so thrilled at what God has done here. And then Peter heads back. And as he returns back to Jerusalem, while he goes back there, there's a lot of grumbling that has preceded him. And the rumors have gone before him. And the people are unhappy with him. Peter gets before the leaders of, this, of, of the church there. And he tells them all the great things going on and, and the way in which God broke out. He's looking for smiles and encouragement. And all he gets is big fat nothing. They sit there with no expression on their faces. You could tell nobody was buying it. I remember being on a, being, I was executive pastor of a larger church and the youth staff had put on this great event. I mean, hundreds of kids came to the church. They had bands. It was just going. It was exciting. We had a gym. It was great. <clears throat> Unless you were on the facility staff where it turns out they torn up the bathrooms, there was a fight, the police had to be called, and so we get together that next week, and let's, let's review how this went. This side, <laughs> this side, I, you could see steam coming out of their ears of what they had to do. And I could tell that this really didn't go out quite as well as I had hoped. This is the kind of reaction Peter is getting. And so they have one question for him. After all this, after this going and reaching and teaching, after all this, they have a question. It is not about the spirits moving. It's not about people being added to the kingdom. It's not about techniques of baptism or the Holy Spirit or anything else. The question they ask is this. So you went to his house? You ate with him? That's where they're at. That's how touchy this whole situation is between the Jews and the Gentiles. And yet, this centurion respected Jesus and honored the Jewish faith that he saw all around him. So even with that, that division, he saw that. And we see now in the second message, he must have thought better of it. 
and he decided he needs to send another delegation. And he says in this second message that he himself is not worthy to have Jesus even come under his roof. This man who is looked up to by so many and has authority over the entire region, this man has learned something about life. Even with all of his power, he knows that God is in control. And so as, as he is thinking about this, as he is thinking about Jesus coming, he says, you don't, you don't need to come under my roof. And the real payoff, the real point of this story is Jesus' reaction. This is one of those rare cases we find in the Bible where Jesus himself is dumbfounded. He is surprised. He is shocked. And you might think about it. Because what if your friend or your child or your spouse or yourself is sick or is dying and getting Jesus to come over would you say, oh, don't bother Jesus. You don't have to come by. Would you say, just let him say the word. Heck, no, we wouldn't say that. You'd say, get him in close. Get him right here. I want to see him. I want to know that he's doing something. I want to watch everything he does. I want him laying hands on her or whatever needs to happen. But I want it all. The centurion, on the other hand, knew that Jesus could do whatever he wanted to. And he didn't have to make a scene. And I wanted to delve a little more deeply into this remarkable picture of faith because Jesus says this is better than anything I've seen and see how we can apply it to our own lives. And so I, I see these three principles. I, they don't rhyme. They don't have an alliterative thing. I wasn't that good today. Here's what you get. Here's the first principle. He honors God above himself. This centurion, he didn't want to bother Jesus. He says he did not deserve to have him under his roof. He did not think he was worthy to come to Jesus. There are two stances in life. One is to honor yourself. It is to say how wonderful and worthy and important you are and how lucky others are to be in your presence. You can tell these people because... Their opinion is the one that counts. Their views are right. And they are a whole lot smarter than those people running around in Washington, D.C. Cindy and I are going to Washington, D.C. tomorrow for a visit, as we mentioned. And if I get a chance, I'll be sure to tell them that I know some folks here in Klamath Falls that are much smarter than they are. So one stance is to honor ourselves. The other is to honor God. That doesn't mean that you think you are ignorant or unworthy or insignificant. It means that you know there is more to things than you see. You realize there are greater perspectives. There is more wisdom from on high than you will ever know. There is a humility to your approach to others because you know that you're far less than God. You might be a big fish by some measure. Your family name gives you legacy in our region. Your business acumen or luck allowed you to invest at the right time with the right company and now you are sitting pretty. Your good looks helped you to marry well. That is certainly true in my case. <laughs> You've chosen a profession or trade that has gone so much better than you could have known and you have reaped the rewards. For some combination of reasons, you are a big fish. But like the centurion, we have to know that God is so much bigger. He is the only one who can keep our ego in check and remind us that as Peter said, no one should ever bow to us, only to him. And of course, life has a way of reminding us of that as we are less than, that we are less than we think we are. I mean, look at this centurion. He cannot help his own servant right there. Jesus alone can help. Over time, looking at yourself devolves into sourness 
into disappointment, that others don't see how great you really are. Our life is seen through the lens of loss. It's a life that looks down. It only sees the problems dogging at our heels. It is always peering into darkness. It says, it sees what is not, and it says, why, Lord? We know that viewpoint because we all go there from time to time. And I don't mean to disrespect those times of incredible pain or loss. We had a memorial uh, a couple weeks ago for Bob. And that day, as we're getting ready for the memorial, there's a young man sitting on the steps right outside here. There was a little drama behind all that. And Cindy goes out to talk to him and gives him a couple of dollars and some. And he was utterly catatonic. He made no response at all. And Robert went out and talked to him, see if he might move. No response. So they had to call in the big gun. So I go out and I sit down next to him. And I don't say a word. I just sit there for about five minutes. And he doesn't acknowledge I'm even there. So I give up and get the real big, bun, big gun, which is Bill Kennedy, who out, goes out and nicely asks him to move. And here's what was going on for this young man. He had been kicked out of the mission for not following the rules. So here is this unkempt, dirty young man living in donated tennis shoes and having nothing else in his life. I mean, I don't know if he had hit bottom, bottom, but if you've been kicked out of the mission and are sitting here on the steps outside the church in Klamath Falls, if you haven't hit bottom, you can see it from there. There are days that are truly dark, and our role in that time is to sit with our friend who is in pain. When the prophet Ezekiel is transported in his spirit to where he is with those Jews who are in captivity... He says, I sat where they sat. He sat among them for seven days and he was deeply distressed. But I also know that our lives can be absorbed by the negative. I remember speaking with a couple who were concerned about their adult son because he was very depressed. There were things that were going on in his life. It was quite, wow, the senior luncheon is happening right now. All right. (laughs) They said this guy had faced some disappointment. And they said, you know, and and he's gone through something similar to you. Really? What's that? Well, he also lost his hair up here. And I thought to myself, because I'm a trained counselor, I didn't say this out loud. But I thought to myself, really? Can I just claim my hairline as a reason to go sit in the corner and suck my thumb? I don't know if that would pass muster. I mean, go to hair club for men or do something, but don't just whine. There are days when we look down, but there are also whole lives that get spent looking down, moaning about what isn't and can't be until all they see is the negative. The other style of life is to look away from ourselves and to look up. It is to see the greatness of God. This centurion, important as he was, knew that he was not the be-all and end-all. That title was reserved for another. Faith realizes that the Lord is so much bigger than my problems. Faith can hardly believe that Jesus would come under my roof and it is so grateful that in Christ he willingly comes not only under my roof but into my life. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open the door and come in, I will share a meal with them. That is the door of your life. And he wants to come over. He wants to come into that life. And our first step of faith is to honor God above ourselves wherever we are in life. The second thing is that the man doesn't have to see a show. There's no question for the centurion of God's power. But he does not need drama or proving something by Jesus' presence. The centurion realizes he can project his own will without showing up. Likewise, he figures for Jesus. He is unshakable in his belief that Christ is able. A little while later, the apostle Paul wrote, would underline this contrast when he wrote, we live by faith, not by sight. When Jesus reinstates Thomas, 
He says to him, do you believe because you have seen? Well, blessed are those are all of those who have never seen and yet believe. Faith believes before it sees. Faith believes in spite of what it sees. Faith believes even when it can't see. Faith sees what the eye cannot. I am reminded that I need to have faith that the Lord has me, has my family, has my future in his hands, whether I can see it today or not. And there's a third thing that faith says. It says this, and God can do what he likes because he is Lord. As we look at this scene of the centurion, there is no demanding that Jesus must save this servant. There is no threat that if he doesn't do this, the centurion will no longer believe or honor who Jesus is. Not at all. As he holds his servant, he is looking up to the Lord and believing him to be a good God. And that, Jesus says, is a picture of faith. That is what faith looks like. And Jesus goes on to say that even in Israel, what might be called the capital of faith, I have found no such great faith. Faith is trusting in the character of God even when life seems to be falling apart. Faith is deciding that nothing will ever make you let go of your Lord no matter what you are facing or what has been said to you. Faith is those three men at the mouth of the fiery furnace saying, our God will protect us and even if he does not. Let it be known that we will not bow down to you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Am I describing you? Is this a season where your faith is strong? Or do you find your faith flagging? Faith is a little bit like vision. A couple of years ago, I learned this phrase about vision. Vision leaks. Over time, it sort of drains out a little more and a little more. You have a big idea about what you want to accomplish and then that starts getting nibbled around the edges with details and bills and complications. And if you're not careful, the big idea fades away while you're putting out the little fires and you are running around doing stuff without any particular reason or direction. The same can be true of faith. So the question is, how can we get a refill? And I think you have to ask yourself, what inspires me? What lifts my eyes from my hairline to the heavenlies? What makes me turn my problems from Goliaths into opportunities for God to show himself? Here's what I do. I read devotions that come on my computer from BibleGateway.com. I read the Bible and I pray and I ask the Lord, what is he saying to me? I look at the stars and I enjoy the sunsets. I get myself to conferences or retreats where I can learn something and think about the Lord in a fresh, new way. I get inspired by the courage of someone who lives faithfully, whether that's one of you or someone from the distant past. And I ask God to give me the gift of faith because the Bible says that faith is a gift from God so that no man may boast. So if you need a faith refill, I invite you to try any of those things I have mentioned. And this service is meant to be a refill as well. Every Sunday we are serving up the stuff that is supposed to make your faith engine roar. That is also what the other aspects of the church are about. The small groups, the studies, whatever we do has one goal to help increase your faith. To shore it up and to strengthen it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And I want to be someone who lives by confidence and assurance, not in my skills, not in my power, not in my influence or persuasiveness or cleverness. I want to be someone who lives by confidence in what he can do. 
I want to live by the assurance that what is unseen is around the corner, closer to me than hands and feet. I want to live by the truth that Jesus' promise to be with me always is not voided by anything this world throws at me. Because we're going to go from here to our homes and our work and our community. And we get surrounded by those things that want us to look down. And we do sit where they sit, but we also look up. And when friends and family and even strangers meet us, when they are sitting on the stair of despondency, just outside the church and not sure where to go, I hope they notice something about us. I hope they see a life that honors and loves God. I hope they see a belief that God can solve this. And I hope they see that whatever happens, our love for God is not going to be shaken. I hope they can look at you and me and say, this is what faith is looks like would you join me in prayer so God I thank you this morning for these faithful friends for this faithful church and God I ask that you would increase our faith however it is done by the work of your spirit allow us to believe in you even more to trust you more to walk with you more And Lord, that's the very purpose of this offering, that it might be put to use in such a way that that others would believe and trust and walk with you more. And so we give this to you, Lord, that you might in turn use this money for great things, that your kingdom might shine through. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So may we all please stand and hold hands across the aisles and with one another. receive this benediction brothers and sisters now go out into this world knowing that you are held in the palm of God's hand in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said Amen Amen. now you